one of the greatest featherweights of all time. He was really a man of the people. He put credibility in the Irish community. He had a bit of a temper. It is such a great story that goes beyond nationality. Truly the story of the American dream. Johnny Kilbane was Cleveland's first sporting hero, a world champion boxer in a time when title holders were household names. That was a century ago, and Johnny's story slowly faded away, like the newsprint that told of his exploits in the ring. But in recent times, Cleveland's Irish American Archive Society has stepped in to save the memory of a forgotten hero in today's Battery Park neighborhood. We had determined that we wanted to have some kind of uh, physical marker of Johnny Kilbane's presence here in the neighborhood that he was living at the time of his first title fight. Battery Park developers had envisioned um, the idea that there would be public art within the development. Public art is important in, in every area, but I think as you uh, redevelop these urban communities, it's always important to maintain that history and, and communicate that history through generations. This was original, a big industrial site. You know, those homes built around it. The concept was you, you live in a neighborhood, you work in a neighborhood, and um, public art wasn't really in the mindset back then. So we took a lot of time and effort to making sure that we put a neighborhood back together. And that's what we try to do here. And I think the public art piece of that is very important. streetscape design, uh, public art projects within the neighborhood, an interesting mix of old and new. It seemed the right place to put a new work commemorating an old figure from the neighborhood's past. Having uh, the Johnny Kilbane sculpture in the Battery Park area um, has so many deep meanings for this community. Growing up in this neighborhood, most of the people were direct immigrants or first generation. And I think their story and their struggle is very similar to what Johnny Kilbane had to uh, go through as well as his family. Johnny Kilbane is a big story and it's important to tell that story. So I kind of relate that to my own family. Uh, my dad's side came from Czechoslovakia. My mother's came from Scotland. Um, so, you know, I always look at uh, these stories and, and you know, um, think about where our ancestors came from and, and what they did. Ackle Island, off the west coast of Ireland, has long been a place of immigration, especially to Cleveland, Ohio. Islanders first moved to America's Midwest back in the early 1800s to dig out the Erie Canal, and Ackle Clevelanders have never forgotten their spiritual home. The links between Ackle and Cleveland were further strengthened when the two communities were twinned in 2003. Johnny Kilbane's father followed in the footsteps of his fellow Ackle Islanders when he too took the big boat to Cleveland. When mother does to see not just shock to Sean Tillon, a dog, John J. Kilbane, I guess vision of honey.
Johnny's father immigrated to the U.S. and ultimately Cleveland in uh, about 1870. Uh, he met Johnny's mother, who was also of Ackle roots, uh, but was living here in Cleveland. Johnny was born in 1889 here in Cleveland. Grew up in an area called the Angle, which is a very tough part of town. What we're looking at is the Simon and Titus 1874 map of the Eighth Ward, the city of Cleveland, and specifically uh, the Angle. And uh, this is the neighborhood that he lived in and grew up in. Environmentally, it probably wasn't the best neighborhood to grow up in because the housing was not of the highest quality. In fact, it was of the lowest quality in the city, but for two or three houses there. He had a very rough early life. His mother uh, died when he was very young, about three. Uh, his father became blind. So at a very early age, Johnny had to drop out of school and, and do what he could to support the family. So he spent some time working on the docks and, and doing jobs, whatever he could to, to, to make money for the family. The fact that he had to go to work early, there's, it's a responsibility that you either take or don't take. And if you take it, you begin to learn earlier than a lot of other people. And you get a perspective, too, and I imagine he did the same thing. And probably when he decided to box, I can't speak for him, probably knew that was a way he could bring income to his family. When we decided that we really were going to go for some kind of work of public art, we spoke with uh, Councilman Matt Zone, the Detroit Shoreway Community Development Organization, and they said that another partner would be, you know, really crucial to the effort, which was Land Studio, which is an organization that facilitates public art projects in the city of Cleveland. I think where we really helped was to give some shape to the process of how do you go about getting the right artist involved. But what it came down to um, in this instance was really finding somebody who could really sort of wanted to get deep into the story and, and really be able to um, make, make the story visible through the artwork. Somebody mentioned, should we consider an Irish artist in the mix? And I remembered reading in Irish America magazine not too long before that about a project that Rowan Gillespie had done in Boston, the four Irish Nobel laureates. And I wondered, you know, would it even be possible to interest such a person in this project so far away in Cleveland? But at the encouragement of Greg Peckham at Land Studio, I took a flyer and wrote him an email. And lo and behold, he responded to the email. Rowan Gillespie is internationally renowned for his bronze sculptures. His work stands all around Ireland and beyond. Gillespie's sculptures always tell a story. Gillespie's famine figures haunt the quays in Dublin. As former president of Ireland Mary Robinson says, they describe the indescribable. In recent times, Gillespie has followed the trail of his earlier creations to Toronto's waterfront, and now his telling of the Irish immigrant story moves on to Cleveland. I've done the work of people arriving in Toronto, and then to actually follow the progression of the Irish immigrants and what happened to them, the way they developed within society, or they started off with so little and they developed to become some of the more powerful people in society, I found very interesting. It's like seeing the story of Irish immigration to the United States in one person. It's all sort of compressed into the one life. So Johnny Kilbane just sort of ticked those boxes very nicely for me. I got an email from Margaret Lynch asking if I would make a sculpture of him for Cleveland. I said I would probably come up with two ideas. And so I used really two different approaches. There was a, a list of aspirations for what the group in Cleveland would ideally like to see in the sculpture. And so I took that list quite seriously and developed one sculpture very much around the aspirations they had. On the other one, I'd started to think of boxing and the boxing ring 
as a kind of metaphor for life generally, for success and failure. I mean, in every fight, there's going to be a winner and a loser. And I found that quite interesting to play with the idea of just what's going on within a boxing match. These sculptures I'll be bringing over are very much raw ideas. Uh, if you have a bad maquette, you're never going to get a good sculpture out of it. You've got to have something proper to work from. People tend to think that for making a sculpture that I would do drawings first. I think of waxes as drawings. It's three-dimensional drawing, really, that I'm doing in wax. It's a very suitable material to think in because you don't have to keep it damp or anything like that. You can be pretty rough on it. You can twist it, change it. I was good at bronze casting from the age of 16 when I did the first one. And I'd be most unusual in that um, I cast my own bronzes, that people would normally send them away to a foundry. The next part of the process now is to present the ideas to the, the people of Cleveland. And I suppose whichever sculpture of the two, they might choose to go with if they do, I'd be equally interested in doing either of them. Cleveland sits near the mouth of the Cuyahoga River on the banks of Lake Erie in the heart of the American Midwest. Roads, railways, and waterways met here, and Cleveland became an industrial hub. The legacy of heavy industry is all around the city and underpins Cleveland's renaissance in the arts. Six months into his project, Roan Gillespie has arrived in Cleveland with the maquettes to show to the Irish American Archive Society and also to the Battery Park Homeowners Association. From arriving in Cleveland, Margaret had things planned from the very moment we arrived. Firstly, we went and had a very nice lunch with Kevin and Aaron O'Toole, and it meant quite a lot to me that the O'Tools would be the first people to see what I'd come with, because I really felt that if it didn't have the approval of the O'Toole family, then it wasn't a runner, you know, we had to have their approval first. That was really the first time I developed a really good appreciation for, for the type of work that Rowan did and the type of artist that we were lucky enough to have uh, working on this project. All along, Battery Park has been the main desired location, but Margaret was concerned that all other options should be seen. For example, where the famine memorial is, although it can seem like a very tight space, there was the possibility of having the concept of an evolution from the famine through to the successful American. We also went to the cultural gardens. I could see why many people thought that the cultural gardens might be the right place for, for this. But the truth is that Kilbaum was not a cultural figure, he was a boxer. Sports figures that have been memorialized in, in Cleveland in, in public sculpture. Jesse Owens, the famous track star, being one. Uh, the other is Bob Feller, uh, a Cleveland Indians baseball player that is memorialized at the, at the baseball stadium at Progressive Field. Rowan's piece for Jenny Kilbane will sort of join that family of sports stars who have had, um, you know, made a contribution on a lot of different levels to uh, the history of, of Cleveland, including sports, but above and beyond that. Yeah. Um, that's a big yeah. We also briefly went to the stadium to see an exciting sculpture of a, a baseball player. 
It excited me from the point of view of the movement in it. And I was offering two ideas for Johnny Kilbane, one of them with the movement and one as a more static sculpture. When I saw the one outside the stadium, I was tending more towards thinking that the full action of boxing was the more exciting sculpture. Public art and sculpture has a, a lot of different sort of functions. Um, I think the projects that tend to be the most successful in Cleveland are ones that are somehow bridging the past and the present, and they're part of telling the story of the unique parts of different neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland, both where they've come from, but also where they're going. Well, in Cleveland, there's an incredible variety of public art. I think probably the most recognized piece of public art in Cleveland is the free stamp done by Klaus Oldenburg. I think our aspiration is that art is sort of infused into all aspects of our public environment, whether that's a building in the way that it uh, expresses itself architecturally, or whether it's a sculpture that's part of sort of telling the story of a neighborhood. There's a lot of public art that's already in and around Battery Park. There's these wonderful uh, bluebirds, that, sculptures that were done by a local artist, Mark Riegelman. There's the entryway to the tunnels that lead between this neighborhood and the lake. It's adding to the diversity of the sort of physical environment here. And so I think this is just another example of how old and new design and old and new cities can live together. That's going to be fixed. I think I felt all along that the right place to put the sculpture would be where Johnny Kilburn lived, uh, in the district anyway. The idea that he would have been there from childhood through to the peak of his career. Inside the Battery Park area, we met with uh, Matt Zone and John Spear, and it was wonderful that they showed such enthusiasm for the project and uh, willingness to do anything necessary in order to, to make the thing happen. It soon became clear that the sculpture was going to be coming back to where Johnny lived and fought. Well, this right here now is... Like a lot of the kids at the time, Johnny had a lot of uh, neighborhood fights, just street fights. And ultimately, there was a, a fighter named Jimmy Dunn who was coming to uh, just outside of Cleveland to give an exhibition. And Johnny and some of his friends decided they wanted to go out and, and watch him train. But when they got out there, they found out that the people that Jimmy Dunn was supposed to box with uh, couldn't go. They were hurt. And so Jimmy said he'd be happy to give um, an exhibition if there was anybody that would be willing to, to kind of go a few rounds and spar with him. And so Johnny's West Side pals uh, volunteered him to go and, and be that fighter. Cobain was so good that Dunn wound up becoming his manager instead of uh, Johnny being a sparring partner. Now I was fascinated with that as I checked Jimmy Dunn's record and I didn't see any losses on him. He had a hell of a record. It's kind of very unusual that a guy who apparently was as good as he was would step aside for somewhat younger guy with a much less experience. So Johnny was a very prominent boxer in the late 1910s, and he was ready for a shot at the champion Abe Attell. And the, the promoter at the time wanted to have a tournament, to, and the winner of the tournament then would go to fight Abe Attell for the championship. And so Johnny was in the tournament, and Joe Rivers was the promoter's fighter, the one that he wanted to win so that his fighter could have a shot at the championship. And so he set up the tournament so that Johnny fought all the harder fighters, and then Joe Rivers had kind of the easier path. So they fought for the right to, to go to see Abe Attell for the championship. And in what was kind of a controversial decision, uh, Joe Rivers was declared the winner. And so they, they fought again. And this time, Johnny made sure there wasn't any doubt. So he knocked him out and earned his shot at the championship. Uh, as it turns out, the promoter was not very happy. Um, so he ultimately didn't even give Johnny the championship belt that he deserved from winning the, the tournament. And so the people of Cleveland, um, through the Cleveland press at the time, uh, raised the money and actually bought Johnny a championship belt. And so that's the belt that, uh, that I have here. 
Um, that's kind of the only belt that Johnny ever received, but it was not because the promoter gave it to him, but it's because the people of Cleveland um, supported him so much that they pulled their money together and, and got the belt for him. At one time, it had uh, quite a few diamonds in it. Um, now, they're, they're no longer diamonds, they're just pieces of glass. Um, and that's as a result of during the Depression, they needed money to put food on the table, and so that was one of the ways they could do it, was to actually take the diamonds out of the belt and sell them. And then your able-bodied assistant can join you? <laughs> In kind of community office, there was a meeting with the residents and uh, concerned people, because public art is for the public. At the public, you, you can't come and sort of project your own ideas into a public space and go along and say, well, I'm an artist, I know best, because we don't know best, but these are the people who are going to have to live with the sculpture. So I was very concerned how people would respond. And you also know that conflict is going to come into it. It can go wrong at any step along the way. Uh, and, and I think what it really does come down to is um, the trust between the community, the commissioning group, and, um, and, and the artist, and the ability of the artist to listen and understand that um, this isn't a gallery project. This is um, about a person, and it's going to be situated in a public space where people are going to have to um, interact with it and see it as part of their everyday life. The feeling on it, of course, was positive, but there was some mixed feelings uh, because it involved boxing. And some people uh, in the community thought it might uh, project a, an image of maybe a violent sport. Other people love boxing, so it had to run its course. Boxing itself has undergone such a shift in terms of American popular culture. In Johnny Kilbane's day, there was the phrase, boxing is king. And when you look at the place of boxing in popular culture today, it doesn't have that central place. And so uh, the fact that we were going to put a sculpture commemorating a boxer within a residential neighborhood was a little bit controversial. I hope I'm not repeating myself too much. Johnny Kilbane was actually a friend of my father. And that's why when I heard that there was uh, some concern about a boxing uh, statute coming into the community, I stepped forward to be on the committees so that I could uh, make my views known that uh, this is not only a boxer but a great man. When I see that sculpture, I see a little piece of my dad in it, and it really uh, has an effect on me. That, that, so I'm actually moving very far away from the If you listen too carefully and I'm try sure to get like everybody to agree, you can finish up with a bad sculpture in the end because it becomes too much of a compromise. So to actually hold the sort of decisiveness as the artist while listening to people at the same time, that becomes very difficult. I was very pleased with how it went at the meeting. I think there were one or two people who possibly weren't quite so happy about the concept of a figurative sculpture going into the site. But the fact, I think, that I was coming with two fairly strong ideas, I think gave the potential for each person to have their input. I think that the, the three is a more complete representation of, of all the comments that people have made and what we're trying to accomplish, and it's um, more meaningful in a lot of different ways. Right, in order to make The eventual decision was to go with a progression of the boy, the boxer, and the statesman. Johnny boxed his way to a shot at the world title in 1910. But the champion, A. Battelle, was also an all-time great fighter and had more experience than his young challenger. But Johnny had put up a good show, good enough for the boxing writers to demand a rematch. And just over a year later, on February 22, 1912, Johnny, after a two-day train ride, pitched up in the champion's backyard in Vernon, California, for another crack at the great A. Battelle. Well, a. Battelle was a great fighter. He had an incredible record as a feather featherweight champion. No question, A. Battelle was an all-time great. He had to fight the crowd. It was Attell's hometown, OK? Obviously, not only was the crowd rooting for Attell, presumably, in a close fight, A. would have gotten the edge. I think the biggest hometown advantage, really, 
is the guy has to travel there and has some kind of a, whether you call it jet lag or travel lag or whatever. And Kilbane had to come, obviously, from Cleveland, Ohio to Vernon, California for that fight. In front of 10,000 screaming Attell fans and in 100 degree heat, Johnny Kilbane completely outboxed the champion. By the time the final bell rang after 20 rounds, Attell's hometown advantage was not enough. Kilbane was the clear winner, and the title was his. Cleveland got ready to welcome home its first world champion. When this man won that championship, he put credibility in the Irish community. For the first time, they had a hero. They could gather around him, and so could Cleveland. Cleveland, Ohio had their champion for 12 years. Nobody's ever matched it, not even Cassius Clay, nobody. March 17th, 1912, and when 200,000 people turned out to meet Johnny Kilbane, that was more people than had ever turned out for a president of the United States arriving in Cleveland. And uh, although it was on St. Patrick's Day, but many were not Irish, they were other nationalities. And even the mayor, who was not Irish, uh, recognized this great contribution. This is the house that Johnny returned to in 1912, the great victor of our city. And uh, this is where the sculpture will be uh, located, just uh, literally a stone's throw from his house in Battery Park. Johnny Kilbane was living the American dream. He was the boy from the neighborhood who fought his way to fame and fortune. He had moved his family from the Angle to Herman Avenue, a part of Cleveland that will forever be linked to the great boxer, the area now known as Kilbane Town. There's something about walking in the footsteps of the person who you're, you're trying to portray. You feel you get to know them a little bit better by doing so. Then we went on to St. Coleman's, and that is just a gem of a church. I mean, it, it, it's wonderful to see it, to see the quality of the craftsmanship. St. Coleman's Parish Church was founded in 1880 as a spiritual focal point for the Irish population on Cleveland's west side. Just a stone's throw from his house on Herman Avenue, Johnny regularly attended Mass at St. Coleman's. An imposing church building was completed in 1918. Most of the work was done by Irish stonemasons, one of whom was Patrick Pierce's father, James. Very humbling for any artist, sculptor in my case, to see this intricate work that sculptors before me were doing with so much attention to detail, so much emotion. My grandmother, Mary O'Toole, was Johnny Kilbane's daughter, and she was a wonderful person, so proud of her heritage and her family, and she talked about Johnny all the time and even had a somewhat of a shrine to him in her house. My grandma was very young when Johnny won his boxing championship, so her life was always very glamorous, it sounded like. They would travel all over the world, really. The world champion took his family on an emotional journey to his father's homestead on Ackle Island. But this was 1922, and war-torn Ireland was a dangerous place to be. I don't think Mom went to Ireland very often, but she always told me the one that uh, she was extremely frightened when she got to Ireland because apparently there must have been some kind of a motorcade that Grandpa was involved in, and she being around 11 years old, I'm sure was probably in the same car. But someone took a shot at Grandpa by, by mistake, according to her, was uh, she thought that he Maybe looked not. like somebody else. But it kind of makes sense that they would then move on to London very quickly because she, she said that story over and over again and, and the fear in her voice when she said it meant that she probably was very happy to move on. <laughs> I believe it was in 1922, they went over to Ireland and England 
and she would sing before the Queen, and she had a great voice, and I think Johnny was always inclined musically and was always interested in acting and wasn't able to do that because his life was so hard, and I think he wanted to give to his family and make their life better than his, and so he gave her all the opportunities that he maybe didn't have, and she went on to get a music degree, she was a teacher, but she would always tell us about the time she sang before the Queen and how great that was. It became quite a treat that I was able to see the grandson, the great-grandson, and the great-great-grandson to Johnny Kilburn. So I realized that for depicting um, Johnny Kilburn at different ages, that I have models for it. So I did photograph members of the family. I did photograph the grandson and the great-great-grandson. One day after school, um, my grandpa John asked me if I wanted to get my picture taken for Johnny Kilbane as a young boy. I didn't know how much we looked like each other until I saw the picture of Johnny Kilbane as a young boy. It was a real treat to see how similar he is and to actually get to know Johnny Kilbane by sculpting his great-great-grandson and his grandson. So I've started by sculpting the two faces of the, the living descendants, and by sculpting them, I'm getting to know better what Johnny Kilburn himself looked like, because you come across these little things as you're working and you think, aha, uh -huh. so that's how his forehead was, that's how, how his ear was, that, that, that it's amazing how those little traces are still there. I haven't uh, taken the head of an older figure and sort of dropped the years from it to see if I can find the 25-year-old in him. But we'll see what happens. I can see him coming there, but he's got a very long way to go. Johnny Kilbane fought at a time when boxing was one of the most popular sports in America. Big fights were filmed and shown in cinemas throughout the country. Only a fraction of these early films survive. And until very recently, Johnny Kilbane's remarkable boxing career was largely confined to old newspaper reports. But when his grandmother died, Kevin O'Toole was left with the task of sifting through the family archives. And what he found was a piece of sporting history. We were cleaning out her attic and her garage and found lots of old memorabilia, and included in that was several old films. I didn't at the time appreciate how difficult it would be to get them restored or actually what was on them. Um, it was more just a curiosity. And what I found was that these films were very badly deteriorated. Some of them were nitrate films, which had become illegal to own as of 1950. They're highly flammable. At that point, I started to appreciate how difficult it was to transfer them and how difficult it was to work with them. But ultimately, we, we talked to several people. Steve Lott got involved, who um, was part of Big Fights, which owned all of the um, rights to boxing films worldwide. And he had a guy that had done some restoration work. He was able to restore them frame by frame and put them back in the right order, slow the speed down, uh, improve the quality the best that he could. They were some scenes that were very, very badly damaged. And that film was interesting because it included quite a bit of training footage and it showed a very different side of Johnny hanging out with his family, which was great to see as well. The bronze casting process is sensitive enough that it will pick up a fingerprint. So every part of this has to be done with great care, not to 
sort of mess up a little bit of the texture while cutting or pushing on it. My grandmother would hate me for using her silver knives in this way, but it's the best use I found for them. Mainly because the steel on the blades is so much better than you'd find on any knife you bought today. So I've used these knives for 30 years now. The belt, which he always seemed to wear, rather like a judo belt, you can actually take bits of material and dip them in wax. And then the material burns out as easy as anything, very nicely, in fact. Uh, so, you know, I don't quite want my wife to know about this, but it's something I found in her yoga studio, and I think she's been looking for it ever since. But um, there it is on Johnny. temper and we were at dinner one night and I decided to leave <laughs> and go out by the television to watch the television and I must have said something inappropriate to him because he jumped up grabbed a, a baked potato and fired it at me right over and hit, hit the radiator right next to me so I uh, <laughs> paid attention at that point and uh, shut my mouth I'd not be conscious did, so that was the end of that Johnny had a very long um, career. He was the champion for over 11 years. Uh, he lost the title in 1923 to Eugene Cricky, who was a French war hero. Johnny was past his prime. Also, I think his main thing was skill, but he relied a lot on foot speed, too. Now, foot speed is the first thing that goes. But G Eugene Cricky was a hell of a fighter, a tremendous puncher, and uh, very game. What was interesting uh, story that I learned about Eugene Cricky was that during the war, he'd actually been shot and his jaw had been blown off. And so they had replaced it with a, a metal jaw. So when they talk about boxers having an iron jaw and being able to take punches, uh, Eugene Cricky literally had uh, an iron jaw. Johnny fought over 140 times and only had four losses. But nonetheless, Johnny had kind of come to the end of his career. His hair was very gray. Um, and so in the sixth round, Eugene Cricky knocked him out. Uh, and that was the last fight that Johnny ever fought. If you take a wax and embed it in a block of cement or plaster, which you then heat up, the wax will run out the bottom of that block of cement. So you get left with a cavity inside, which is where the wax was. So you've lost the wax. Once you've got that cavity, you can melt a pot of bronze. The bronze taken to around 1,200 degrees and poured into that cavity. But if there's any moisture at all in that mold and you pour the bronze in, the bronze will literally shoot out the top again. But uh, I've never had the big accident with it. The fire brigade were called once, but it was a false alarm. I was just, it looked a bit dangerous. So I called to be on the safe side, but nothing actually happened. The thing people imagine is that the bronze now has to cool for days afterwards, but actually that bit is not true. The bronze freezes really quickly. And then simply smash the mold. It basically has fallen apart anyway. It just lasts for long enough to receive the bronze. And then you've got, down to a fingerprint, you've got an exact reproduction of your wax. And sometimes I even use the technique of throwing the whole mold into a tank of water in order to get a, a kind of patina effect onto my bronzes.
With his title gone, Johnny's fighting days were over. He set up a training camp on his farm in Vermilion, Ohio, where the old champion taught health, fitness, and of course boxing to wealthy clients. Life was good for Johnny Kilbane. But the Roaring Twenties would end with the stock market crash and usher in the Great Depression. Johnny lost his business, his farm, and his fortune, estimated to be over a million dollars. So the old prize fighter dusted himself off and fought his way back once more. He had to reinvent himself, uh, so to speak. And so he decided he wanted to uh, ultimately get into politics. He initially ran for sheriff and lost, wasn't successful. Uh, he was elected to the Ohio State Senate and served there for several years and then became the clerk of courts in Cleveland. So he had a very long career in politics uh, after his career in boxing was over. first. Uh, my early memories of my grandfather, he was always interested in giving us his life experiences. So when he would come home from work and I was through with school, uh, we'd go in the kitchen and we'd have what I would call the kitchen chats. And I, being about maybe 12 years old, would patiently sit there. He would give me all kinds of advice, I'm sure. And it's strange that John mentions the kitchen chats because he, he did leave out one important part was that Grandpa always liked to uh, spread the wealth and, and share things. And so we had a little dog at the time and he had this great big cup and he would give the dog some of what he was drinking too. So we had a true Irish dog who loved Guinness. I think in his day, Johnny Kilbane was, of course, revered as a hometown hero because of his achievements as a world champion in boxing. But more than that, he was valued as a caring uh, member of the community who was known for always be willing to lend a helping hand. Uh, people have told us, you know, he co-signed the loan on my grandfather's house. He loaned my family a car so that they, you know, the bride could arrive in the wedding at, in style and things like that. He was the first world boxing champion, um, one of the greatest featherweights of all time. Uh, he also did well in the political field, um, extremely popular. I think he brought the community together, and I'm sure among the Cleveland Irish in particular, he was a source of pride. My grandfather and I would walk downtown Cleveland, and invariably, everybody that walked by him would say, hi, Johnny, hi, Johnny, hi, Johnny. And of course, he didn't know these people by name. So he'd say, hi, cuz, hi, cuz. And I'd say to him, Grant, who is that? He said, well, I really don't know, but I don't want him to feel bad. So I call him my cuz. Johnny died in 1957. He had been suffering from cancer. And his wife, Irene, died just a few months later. Um, they were very close. They had been together so long since grade school. Ultimately, I think it's, it's one of those situations where she probably died of a broken heart. Each of the three figures is up on a quite a high pedestal, a bit like in the Olympics, you know, when you have the three winners, the gold medalists, the silver and the bronze. So I've taken him at each age and put him as a champion. But there was originally a very linear movement through the sculpture with the little boy behind, then the boxer in the middle, and then the old man in the front. But the one thing I learned from Johnny as well was that he knew how to stop boxing at the right time. So suddenly the old man went behind the boxer because I realized that you have to know that there's the moment you peak in life. We all have our opportunity at some stage, but also know, knowing how to step back from it is, is the thing that Johnny really taught me. It seemed that other things in life were more important to him. And 
I think that was a great ability he had. He never gave up, but he knew when to step back. It's a ridiculous technique I use. I mean, it's, it's totally illogical not to have anybody helping at any stage. But I find that to really be able to get close to whatever I'm sculpting, that I don't like having anyone around. I like to be alone with that person. For Johnny Kilbane, what I did was took a studio space, cover it with his photographs, so the whole room becomes a shrine to him. And then you start with nothing. And then gradually you build up this thing in clay or wax and then cast it to bronze. And then three months later, four months later, you've got two and a half ton of bronze and nobody has touched any of it. It's like an incredible way of bonding with the person, really feeling you get to know them. One of the logistical challenges was getting the sculpture from Dublin to Cleveland. And Rowan Gillespie was so passionate about this project, he volunteered to take the crates from his studio in Dublin to Antwerp personally. There they were going to go on a direct route to the port of Cleveland. This boat, all summer long, just keeps on going back and forth, round trips, round trips. And I began to be very worried that the boat <laughs> might not be here uh, by the time Rowan Gillespie had, you know, agreed to come to install the sculpture. And we had set up all the workers and the contractors who were going to be involved for this, a particular day, September 11, 2014. But all was well. It arrived uh, the Sunday before, and we got a lot of cooperation from both the port and the uh, shipping company. We wanted the crates unloaded from a ship that was arriving on the docks in Cleveland, where Johnny Kilbane's father had worked and where Johnny had his first job as a water boy on the docks and also worked in the railroad. So it meant to us that the project was sort of coming full circle in a way, um, coming back to the beginning. With all the timing of a great boxer, the sculpture finally arrived at Battery Park in Cleveland with a day to spare. And it was fitting that many of the tradesmen there to welcome it were of Ackle descent. Well, I think that it, it was uh, the most amazing team of people working to put up the sculpture that, uh, I must say, Everybody really pulled out the stops to make it go very, very easily. And guys who were willing to do absolutely anything I wanted them to do. An amazing group of people. It's in. Come on down. The journey from a plaque to an artwork of world-class significance was an amazing one. It's a journey that took a family, a neighborhood, a community, a special artist of extraordinary sensitivity, and now all of you. Thank all of you incredible people who I've worked with. I mean, this has been the most amazingly positive project to work on. It's had so many dimensions to it. But uh, now it's time for me to stop talking and the sculpture to do the talking.
gave Rowan Gillespie a very lengthy design brief, asked him to do the impossible, embody the aspirations of a neighborhood, of a city, of an ethnic group, the Irish Americans, all in the story of one individual. But he really pulled it off brilliantly in encapsulating an individual life, but one that had universal resonance. Actually seeing my family's resemblance in the different stages of Johnny's life, uh, just really overwhelming. Those three different statutes, I think, really capture how many times you can pick yourself up and, and go on and succeed in many different ways. I think my grandfather would probably look on the sculpture project and, and say uh, something to the effect, was that really me? to that poem, The Fighting Heart, because he only had a fifth grade education. Then his poem, I think, is an excellent, excellent portrayal of people who have had it tough all their life and to keep the faith. Mm -hmm. 